Hello and welcome to Choose FI. Today on the show, we're talking about a really critically important topic that doesn't get enough attention in the FI community, charitable giving, and specifically effective giving, and how charitable donations factor into your FI journey and a well-lived life. We're joined by Rebecca Herbst, who is a longtime member of the Choose FI community and an admin of our Ogden, Utah local group. She's the founder of yieldandspread.org an organization that is on a mission to use personal finance as a force for good. They teach the ins and outs of investing and financial planning, but with a greater goal to encourage people to give back and help others. They donate 100% of their proceeds to high impact charities. Jack Luer sits on the board of Yield and Spread and is the executive director for One for the World, a community of people who have pledged to give 1% of their income each year to charity. One for the World is revolutionizing charitable giving by making it incredibly easy to donate to the best nonprofits in the world that address extreme poverty and global health issues. They are also dedicated to building a thriving, sustainable community of individuals who share values in effective giving through organizing, training, and education. I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. I know I had an absolute blast speaking with Rebecca and Jack. And it really opened my eyes to the general concept of charitable giving, of course, which has always been in the back of my mind, but effective giving and what that truly means. I think you're really going to enjoy this. And with that, welcome to Choose Up High. Rebecca and Jack, thank you both so very much for being here. I really appreciate it. So glad to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, this should be fun. This is a long time coming. I think charitable giving and and effective giving is something that's, it's so critical and it touches all of us, but yet, I mean, I've done 600 plus episodes of Choose FI and we've never dedicated an entire episode to this. So this clearly is a hole that needed to be filled and I appreciate both of you being here. So I guess, why don't we start with uh, Jack? Let's just start with your background on charitable giving, effective giving. Give us just a quick overview because I think a lot of people just don't even have a sense of the the definitions of these things. Yeah, so I think I got into this the same way a lot of people do, which is when I was younger, I had a general philanthropic urge. So I decided I wanted to work in the charitable sector, but without really knowing anything about what that meant. And I felt like life wasn't fair and there were people who were harmed by things that were outside their control because it's not a level playing field and that we should do something about that. But I didn't really have any clear idea of what that should be. And so to begin with, I did stuff that I guess is quite standard. So I volunteered in a soup kitchen when I was at university and I made the odd donation here and there to a charity that had caught my eye. But then the real change moment for me was I read a book by a bioethicist called Peter Singer about how some charities are demonstrably better at making change than others and how also we can all survive comfortably on less than 100% of what we earn And when you put those two things together, if you give even a small percentage of your income away to very, very cost effective charities, you can make a massive difference. And so at that point, I took a giving pledge to give away 10% of my income. And I did that when I was 21. And then I kind of put that philanthropy into practice as well as donating by co-founding a charity in the UK called the School of Hard Knocks, which uses rugby and boxing to help children who are at risk of being excluded from school to complete their education. Did that for 10 years. And then when I wanted to leave that and move into something else, thought, well, I already do this effective giving. So why don't I go and work in this space as well? And that's how I came to One for the World. Gotcha. Okay. So first curiosity, what's the title of that book? Because I'm sure some people are going to be curious about that. Well, the most accessible book is called The Life You Can Save, and that's what I would recommend. I actually read a book called Practical Ethics, which is more written for people studying philosophy at university and is a bit more dense, but the effect would be the same. Although it's worth saying, it also told me to go vegetarian, and I only did that about two years ago. So it's funny how change works in our minds. Interesting. Okay, so you did take that to heart, but it took eight plus years, right? Yeah, it's a solid decade for me to take <laughs> reaction on what, what was an equally well-argued piece of philosophy. <laughs> so the giving pledge, 10% of income, and you did this in your 20s, your early 20s, right? So yes. talk me through what precisely is the giving pledge? I, I think a lot of people are aware loosely of some of these type of giving pledges. I know famously Warren Buffett, Bill and Melinda Gates, et cetera. But I think a lot of people naturally then say, oh, that's just for DECA billionaires. 
not for people like me. Yes. So the giving pledge specifically is the pledge promoted by Bill Gates and Melinda French, which is to give at least 50% of your wealth away on your death or by the time you die. And that is aimed specifically at the ultra rich. The pledge that I took is called the Giving What We Can Pledge, and that is more accessible to ordinary people. And it's a pledge to give at least 10% of your income away until you retire. Now, depending on your financial circumstances and your financial goals, that may not be easy. But certainly in my case, I went straight from university to being in work. And one thing we know about the psychology of giving is as long as the money never reaches your bank account, you can usually learn to live on 90% of your income. It's a bit more difficult if you've become accustomed to living on 100% of your income and then try to give it away, although that's also possible. But in my case, I just made this idealistic commitment to do this. And so for my whole life, I have effectively internalized the idea that I earn about 90% of what I actually earn. And I haven't found that particularly difficult to stick to. Yeah, I love that. I think for people listening, obviously, who are in the fight community, we've built lives where we can save, however that looks like, 30 to 50 plus percent maybe, right? Which is wonderful. So I think we certainly understand, okay, what does it look like to build a life you can quote unquote afford? right? So if giving is part of that, then that is just simply a line, if you will, it's a line item in your budget, right? So building that life makes perfect sense. And Rebecca, obviously, I want to get you in here and talk about the intersection of FI and such. But just one last quick question for Jack before we move on, which is, so these giving pledges, I think the issue has always been like, what seems like the irrevocable nature of it, And while it's not that, right, it's not like the world is going to come to an end if you only gave 7% this year because of whatever arose in your life. I think that's what's held me up. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. This is so common. I hear this all the time in my job. I have people who write to me and say, I'm taking a career break. Is it okay if I don't donate in this period? To which the answer is yes, obviously, because it's an (laughs) income pledge and your income is going down. And the nice thing about percentages is they scale. So if your income goes down, the amount you're supposed to donate goes down. But it is also completely fine to pause your pledge to reduce the percentage that you're giving. The point is, though, that most of us do philanthropy in this very haphazard, sporadic way. And that applies to which charities we choose, where we often choose nonprofits on a real whim with really bizarre decision making processes, but also the amount where <laughs> I, I sometimes joke it's a bit like, you know, a drunk managing their money. And that <laughs> on payday, you give a bigger donation because you feel rich. And then, you know, two weeks later, when you've spent some of that, you give a smaller donation. And this is why I think pledges can be really valuable because they try to peg you to an amount, but it's not a contract signed in blood. It's not even a legal contract. You know, you you obviously should feel some sense of personal obligation to stick to it, but I would never encourage anyone to stick to this to the point of financial hardship for their family. Yeah. And I'll pop in here too. I think one of the great things about a pledge is you're also surrounding yourself with a community of other people who are also giving back. And I think it's just like with finance, right? Like when you surround yourself with the Choose a Five community, you're seeing all these people do things that seem really hard from the outset. But when you see the average person that's maybe just like you, a similar demographic doing something amazing, I think it's a lot easier to do. My husband and I actually, this year, we were reviewing our finances heading into 2024. And we've actually decided to double our donations, wow. which on one sense is like, wow, that feels really scary. But then on the flip side of it, we're saying, well, let's just try it. Like, let's just do it for the year and see how it goes. And if it feels too hard, we can scale back. We don't have to necessarily scale all the way back to what we were doing before. But it's really just taking those steps forward with anything, whether it's like trying to work out for the first time or trying new foods. It's just taking that first step. And and once you do, it feels a lot less scary. And let me say something else about pledging and percentages. One of the things that percentages helps us to do is to scale our giving according to our affluence. And there are lots of forces that stop us doing that. Your listeners might be familiar with something called adaptive affluence, where as you get richer, you typically adapt your minimum expectation of your lifestyle to that new level of wealth. Sometimes this is called the hedonic treadmill. Percentages help to combat that because if you stick to a percentage of your income, if your income goes up over time, which it does for most people in their careers, you will 
at least to some extent, scale you're giving with your income. Now, strictly speaking, because of the law of diminishing returns, you should actually give higher percentages of your income as you get richer because the hundred thousandth dollar that you earn in a year is worth a lot less to you than the ten thousandth dollar. And if you're lucky enough to earn a million dollars in a year, you really probably don't need that millionth dollar to change your material quality of life. But at least the percentage keeps you honest. And then the other thing that's interesting is we have a ton of data on charitable giving that shows us very clearly that people who pledge percentages give more. And that's, I think, a sort of loss aversion that comes in where if you tell yourself, well, as I get richer, I will be more generous, that's all very well. But once the money's in your bank account, it kind of feels like it's yours and it's a bit difficult to give it away. And this is also borne out in the data where by income bracket, the richest people are by far the least generous. So people in the bottom income bracket in the US give a higher percentage of their income than people in the top income bracket, which is actually completely shameful, by the way. But this is an effect of kind of loss aversion and sticker shock where people think, oh, well, $100 is generous. And the fact that I earn $400,000 a year doesn't make me any less generous for giving $100. Well, actually, it does make you significantly less generous than someone who's earning under $50,000 and gives 100 bucks. And so it can be a way of, of just making sure that you're always giving an amount that is appropriate to your wealth and affluence. Yeah. And it's funny going back to what you said before about like a, a essentially a drunk listing from one thing to the other, just haphazardly giving money. I, it feels like you've maybe seen into my tax return a little bit because that's what it feels like. And I don't think that we are uncharitable, but it often feels haphazard. And I think that's what I'm so excited to talk to both of you about is almost not that I expect to come out of this episode with a plan per se, but at least to just have a, a better direction. And I think speaking of direction, talking about that, the loss aversion, which is so important. We, we talk all the time here at Chooseify about essentially how to take your brain out of the decision-making process, make things automatic, make it so that, like you're saying, Jack, you don't have to look at a number on a screen and then see a smaller number after you've done something, whatever it may be. Are there ways that either of you have found to make this automatic? that it's worked for you in the past? Yeah. So I think giving can be easy, but it seems hard in some ways. And I think there's a variety of reasons, but there's a couple points of friction that I feel like I've kind of gotten past. So converse to Jack, what Jack was saying earlier, like from a young age, he felt this sense of altruism and wanted to give back. For me, it was a little different. For most of my adult life, I I didn't actually give with much generosity. I think, Brad, maybe I was a little more like you. Like if someone was running a marathon and they said, hey, will you help me raise the funds so I can run in this marathon and also give back to charity? Or if a climate activist on the street approached me and said, hey, donate to this cause, you know, I would donate to that. Or if I read about something in the media, but I had no systematic way of approaching giving. And so I think not having a system is what makes giving hard. And so there's, I think, three main points of friction. The first is where to give, right? So like if you're walking down the street and someone asks you for money, you may feel very excited to give to that cause because it's something you're passionate about, or you could actually just feel assaulted, right? Like you're on your way to work, you're super busy, and it makes you feel uncomfortable almost like, how dare you ask me this question as I'm trying to do other things with my life? And it makes you feel guilty and uncomfortable. But if you actually sit down and take a moment to think about like, what are the things that I want to give to, and whether that's something that you're passionate about, feel close to, or in the case of me and Jack, which we can talk about more in a bit, effective giving, donating dollars that save the most lives possible. If you have an idea of what these charities are or these interventions are that you want to spend your money on then you already have a framework that exists. And we could talk a little bit more about what some of those resources are, like if you just have no clue, right? Like where should I begin? So the first is where to give. The second is overcoming that feeling of I don't have enough. Now, for some of your listeners, like they may not have enough, right? Like they may not have enough. They may be on minimum wage. They may be taking care of their parents, their families. But I would say for most people that are pursuing that, FI path, right? They're accumulating wealth. If you are making 60,000 US dollars a year annually, 
you are in the top 1% income earners in the world. So while you may not perceive yourself to be rich, you are. So it's hard to overcome that mindset though when you're on the path to FI and all you're doing is like trying to accumulate wealth and you're working really hard to save and sort of squirrel away that money. And so it feels like you don't have enough, but we know like that we are accumulating that wealth and and do have a lot of space to give back. And then I think the third is for a select group of people is optimization. So I know that when I do things with my finances, like if I invest or if I tax loss harvest, I'm doing something in the most tax optimized way possible. So I think for a lot of wealthy people who are looking to give away meaningful sums of money, and that could be a couple of hundred dollars a year, that could be thousands of dollars a year, that could be tens of thousands of dollars a year. They're not exactly sure how to do that in a tax optimized way. And so because of that, perfect is the enemy of good sort of mindset, they end up never giving at all. So I think that there's ways that in which we can think about and make it easy for people to help them figure out where to give, help them understand to sort of pry away from that scarcity mindset and help them understand like how they can do a lot of good. And then also how they can do that, whether it's donating cash, whether it's donating stocks, what types of accounts we donate from. And so at Yield and Spread, which is the nonprofit I founded, we're on a mission to kind of bring these two worlds together to make it as easy as possible to understand how to give from a personal finance sense. Yeah, I love that. And I definitely want to dive into the nuts and bolts because I think that that is really important. Obviously, we can just send people to so yieldandspread.org and we'll talk about that at the end, but that's important clearly. So I want to dive into optimization because I think this is a really important thing, like the actual effective altruism. And I think that's a phrase that a lot of us have heard. Will McCaskill, I think, is, at least to my knowledge, the founder of that. And unfortunately, effective altruism took a little black eye with Sam Baker and Freed and, and such. But that obviously doesn't negate the importance and value of it, just because one rogue person. But it, but it has been in the news, right? So I remember reading years ago that, oh, if you want to be the most effective way possible is to just buy mosquito nuts. And whether that's true or not, uh, maybe you guys, you're both nodding. You could chime in on that. But I think this goes back, Jack, to your thought of like the, I keep using the word haphazard. And that's how I think of it is, you know, we give to our local charities, essentially whether they're effective or not, just because it's, it's visceral, right? We, we know these people in many cases. We see, again, whether it's effective or not, we see the impact in our local environment and community as opposed to, okay, maybe it would have been better to spend that $500 and buy mosquito nuts right? But how should someone even begin to attempt to think about that? It's such a weighty issue. The most important thing for your listeners to know is that where you choose to give is substantially more important for how much good you will do than how much you choose to give. And the reason for that is that the difference in impact between an average nonprofit and a brilliant nonprofit is demonstrably a hundred to a thousand times more cost effectiveness. So most people, there was a big survey done on this, and they asked a lot of people, what do you think the difference is between an average and a brilliant nonprofit? And they said, oh, I think the brilliant nonprofit will be two and a half times more cost effective than the average. No, it is a hundred to a thousand X different. And obviously what that means is most people cannot give a hundred or a thousand times more to charity than they do right now, but they could do a hundred to a thousand times more good by choosing the most cost effective programs. The second thing to think about here is you have to choose. Unfortunately, there are about 1.7 million nonprofits in the US, most of which are doing a good job. Although I did hear an episode about some that are set up to convince offensive linebackers to go to certain universities, which shouldn't be charities. (laughs) But broadly speaking, most of these things are doing a good job. There are too many causes in the world that you will want to support for you to fund all of them. So you have to choose. And then once you know you have to choose, it seems a really sensible way of choosing to try and find where your money can do the most good. Because all of these causes are deserving. If you try to force rank, you know, is is, is a, a child dying of malaria in the Democratic Republic of Congo more deserving of my support than a woman in an abusive relationship in America 
or than a refugee fleeing the war in Ukraine? That is, I think, an almost impossible question to answer. But what you can do is say, I know that I can help prevent malaria for under $10. And it's very unlikely that I can make a meaningful change in the other two cases for under $10. And so if I only have a finite amount of money to give, it seems like a really good way of choosing between these causes to look for the most cost effective ones. And that for me is the heart of effective giving is understanding that where you choose to give is the single most important decision that you make. And that It is a morally good thing to try to use your finite resources to do the most good possible. Now, what that will do is it will encourage you towards types of giving that might feel counterintuitive because intuitively we tend to give to local charities. Intuitively, we tend to give to places where we know someone involved in the charity. Intuitively, we give to places where we think we can see the outcome of what we're giving. But the truth is, Charity evaluation is an incredibly specialised field that needs enormous amounts of time and technical expertise to do. And the people who have done this evaluation will give you the advice that you should follow. And they will tell you that it is very, very unlikely that the most cost effective thing you can do is give to your local soup kitchen versus providing nutrition to someone who will otherwise starve to death. Yeah, Jack, I love how you said I think the words that you said were the charity or the intervention that you choose to support is much more impactful than how much money you will give because of the cost effectiveness and the ability to help people. That really resonates with me. One of the things that I struggled with is feeling like I personally had to do all this research. Like I personally had to go out and research are anti-malarial bed nets effective? Is my local soup kitchen effective? And that is a lot of pressure. First of all, I don't have the expertise for that personally. I don't have that much time, but I do have money that I want to give away. And so there are these amazing organizations that are doing the work for you. Give Well is one. The Life You Can Save is another. If you go on these organizations' websites, they have listed right there for you. These are our top charities that we believe can do the most good possible that if you donate to these causes, here are the results, right? If you donate $1,200, this will cover the cost of a fistula surgery and the rehabilitation for one woman and save her life. It's very clear what those outputs are. Whereas if you donate some textbooks to your local high school, do we know if those textbooks are actually helping kids graduate? Do we know if those textbooks are actually helping those kids achieve higher salaries upon graduation, right? So, you know, I'm not a total facts and numbers person, but what math helps me make these decisions. And again, there are all these organizations helping make it really clear for us to see those things. Yeah, that's wonderful. When Jack said charity evaluation, that was my follow-up question. So I'm glad you answered that. So give well and the life you can save. So those are two of the starting points where people should, I guess, start their research. And we obviously will put those links in the show notes. So that's really useful. Rebecca, I wanted to ask you, so you're so intimately familiar with FI and the FI mindset, right? And I think Mm -hmm. a lot of people try to race to FI. And I think this is something we've tried to really dispel that myth because frankly, like giving away, if you will, or wishing away 10 or 15 years of your life makes little to no sense right? It's part of a holistic life. And I think the argument that you're making here is this is really an integral part of a life well lived. But I guess my question now is, is there some thought of it being better to get to FI and then to give more significantly and more spontaneously than giving in smaller increments along the way? I think that's like a natural question somebody's going to have. Does it make sense to do it along the way? Or if I can give much larger donations in one fell swoop. And I think, honestly, you guys might have already partially answered this in the sense that, all right, I might be thinking along the lines of the old school, hey, let's get your name on a building somewhere, right? Like, obviously, that's not something I aspire to. But I think that's more akin to that one large, cutting a large check to your local children's hospital or something like that, like as opposed to maybe making a difference all along the way. So I've kind of uh, roughly asked and answered a question here, but I'm curious your thoughts on the larger issue of, hey, should I wait until I get to FI? Should I do this all along the way? Is there some magnitude where it matters more or less? Yeah. 
So maybe some people think this could be like a little hypocritical of me, right? (laughs) Because I was one of those like race to fi people, worked as hard as I could, got really high paying jobs and left my job and really didn't start systematically giving until like right around the time that I left my work. And it's candidly, like I, I left my job four years ago. It's it's a big regret of mine. Like it's a big regret that I didn't start doing this sooner. Now it's not a bad thing that I only started donating meaningful sums of money about four years ago. But what I want to say is like, I get it. <laughs> like I really get it. I get how it's hard and I get how you're trying to save up 25 times your annual expenditures so that you can leave your job or pivot or do whatever it is that you need to do. And so it's a struggle. But I also think habit formation is real, right? So if you have never worked out in your entire life, (laughs) and then you think you're going to work out in early retirement, and all of a sudden you've hit 40 years old, right? Your body's a little bit weaker. It's not as strong as it used to be you are unlikely to start working out as easily. Whereas if you've been working out regularly and on a consistent basis, you probably can do three times more or four times more than you used to. And so I think habit formation is real. So if you start donating now on your path to FI, and that could look something like donating on a monthly basis where you're actually like seeing, really seeing yourself giving some money away, it's much easier to carry that forward, right? So like I said earlier to you guys, my husband and I just doubled our donations. Had we never donated before, it would have been really hard to give the amount that we're giving now. And so all the friction that goes into giving, right? Like where you're going to give, as I said earlier, what you're going to give, right? So I just sit down and think, do I want to donate VTI or BND? Do I want to donate from my regular brokerage account? Do I want to open up a donor advice fund and put money in there and then donate from that? I had to come to all these decisions on my own. And so since I've come to those conclusions now, and we can talk more about that, every month now, it's just a click of a button for me. I'm just like, this is what I'm donating. Here are the charities that they're going into. And then every six months or every 12 months, I'm revisiting that strategy and putting more thought into it. And so I get it. I get that it's hard and I get that we want to reach that early retirement stage, but there's so much room to give now. And that's why I went and created this thing called the philanthropy calculator to show that if you did take an income pledge like Jack, like 10%, or even something way more doable, like giving 1% of your income annually each year, like the one for the world pledge, that it really doesn't add that much time to your FI timeline. So if you're coming out of school, earning 60K a year, saving 30%, you have nothing in investments, it's going to take you like 23 years to get to early retirement, assuming nothing changes with you at all. And we know that's not true, right? Like you're probably going to get an income raise. You're going to figure out your expenses, right? But like that's probably standard for like maybe, you know, the demographic listening to this podcast. It's going to take you 23 years. If you were to donate 1% of your income annually, it's going to add another six months of working. (laughs) That is like a drop in the bucket for you to donate 1% of that income, not just through retirement, but through the rest of time. So obviously, if you do something like take a 10% pledge, yeah, that's a commitment, right? Like, right, Jack, that's a commitment. That's going to be like additional years of working for you moving forward. But if you do something that's much more doable, it's really not a big impact. And what I'll also say is there's tons of other things that will change your viewpoint, right? Like a lot of people might start off on the path to FI and think that they have 15 years to go. And then all of a sudden they have six years to go because they got a salary increase or they got a huge inheritance from a family member or their portfolios are doing way better than what the 4% rule taught us it was going to do, right? And so I think when you look at the math in that way, just like with reaching FI, fire, like how could I ever retire early? When you just look at the math, it helps you make those decisions much, much more easily. I think that's exactly right, Rebecca. And I, I would make two points in addition to that. The first one is, as someone who comes a little bit more from the effective giving community and a little bit less from the FI community, if you give 1% of your income and it slows down your retirement by six months, and by doing that, you can prevent roughly... 15 children under five dying for no good reason. 
that is not a difficult moral trade-off. Mm-hmm. That is not a difficult moral trade-off. And the second thing I would say is there is a lot of evidence that the best donation opportunities are being used up over time. So if you're talking about a 20-year horizon for you to go from graduating to financial independence, the donation opportunities we have in 20 years, if they follow the historical trend, will be much less cost effective than the ones we have now. And I'll give you a very obvious example of this. We know that there are high quality malaria vaccines coming down the track. Two have been approved for use with children by the WHO in the last few years. Neither of them is a silver bullet. One has very difficult cold chain logistics associated with it, which will make it hard to deploy in remote areas in hot countries. And neither of them is particularly effective in comparison to other vaccines, like, for example, the COVID vaccines were substantially more effective than these. But what that means, because there are other candidates in trials as well, is that we shouldn't really expect to need to spend an enormous amount of money on malaria prevention in 20 years' time. But right now, this year, in 2024, 600,000 people are going to die of malaria. And we could prevent each one of those deaths with an intervention that costs under $10. And so if you do wait, you should think about whether the donation opportunities you have once you reach FI are going to be as good as the ones that you could be drip feeding into now. And you can do both, right? Like we can do both things. So like if I spend $40,000 a year, right? And I need a million dollars a year to retire early. That a million dollars is not going to just become zero, right? Like a lot of us are reading that Bill Perkins book, Die With Zero. It's a really really powerful messaging, right? We're not going to die with zero, most likely. We're probably going to die with money left over. And so there's an incredible opportunity to give now to people or beings that really need help today. And then also give large sums of money that have compounded over time later on and do really good with that. So For me, I donate stock regularly now. We also donate 100% of proceeds from yield and spread to effective charities as well. So I look at that as like time and skills donation, not just money donation. And then upon my death, even if I still want to give some of that money to the next generation, I've pledged to give 80% of that wealth away upon my death, right? Because I'm going to be, I'm not going to draw down on that completely. I'm taking 4% per the 4% rule. And by the way, I haven't even really been doing that the past four years. And so I know that like, I'm probably going to be okay. And so we can give money now and we can give money later. And to me, that's the best recipe to help with both habit formation, but also to tackle, as Jack was saying, interventions today And maybe there'll be, instead of anti-malarial bed nets, as we know, there's already anti-malarial vaccines coming out. That will come later down the line. I can be donating to that too. I've been experimenting with this idea in my mind. I'm not an economist. So maybe some of your listeners, this will be the point where I become thoroughly devalued in their eyes. But just (laughs) try this out with me. We all accept in the FI community the idea of compound interest. So you put some money in now and it grows a lot because of the effects of compound interest. I think there is something called compound impact, which is if you intervene now and a child under five doesn't die from vitamin A deficiency or diphtheria or tetanus or malaria, that has a compounding effect because that child can then go to school, that child can then get a job, become economically productive, they can vote if they live in a democracy, they can have a family. Also, it will have a big effect on their family. One of the biggest things that stops women participating in the workforce is when they need to have many children because many of them will die in infancy, not to mention the moral cost of losing a child, which must be just horrendous and unimaginable. And so I also think you need to weigh, if you drip feed into your impact now, you will have this compounding impact effect over time. And I feel like if you wait a long time and then make a big donation, it's possible that even though the donation is much larger, your actual overall impact will be less because the cost of doing good will have gone up in the meantime. So you can sort of see these things in in parallel. Now, I don't actually know. I don't know that 
impact compounds at 8% a year or whatever the stock market's supposed to go <laughs> up by on average. And I don't know that the cost of doing philanthropy is going to change in the equivalent ratio. But I do think this is something to think about, which is you have the opportunity to intervene now in a way that may do a lot of good over time. So you should factor that in as well. Mm, I love that. Yeah, I love that as a thought experiment. And it's funny because you mentioned a couple of minutes ago and loosely paraphrasing the highest quality donation opportunities are being used up over time. And I was actually 15, 20 minutes ago, I was going to ask what I thought was almost like a straw man argument or something ridiculous that was a, a thought experiment of, hey, what does this look like in a perfect world? Because as I'm thinking about effective altruism, okay, we all donate to the highest value, let's say malaria or mosquito nets of some sort until that issue or disease, et cetera, is eradicated. And then we all move to the next and it essentially cascades on down. In my own brain, when I thought about that, I thought it was so ridiculous that I didn't, <laughs> didn't bring it up at the time. But then hearing you mention that, it seems like maybe that would be the perfect world scenario. I think that's exactly right. So I'll give you two really hopeful, positive stories. Through a massive international effort and some individual heroism, we were able to develop a smallpox vaccine and deploy that. I think it was first deployed in the 50s, or maybe 60s. It's estimated to have saved a billion lives. No one needs to donate to smallpox prevention now. Wild polio was eradicated about two years ago. There is some recurrence, but there are large multinationals looking at that, like the Bill Gates and Melinda French Foundation. And so a retail donor that is an ordinary person making donations doesn't need to worry about donating to polio prevention now. So what we do over time is we change the bar of what we think cost effectiveness is. And in the amazing world where we eradicate malaria, which I believe will happen during my lifetime, we will move on to the next problem, for sure. And there are lots of problems that we can definitely eliminate. It really is insane that we live in a world where a child can get diarrhea and it can kill them. That is just crazy. It is crazy that we live in this world when a packet of oral rehydration salts that costs next to nothing would prevent that happening. So we can live in a world where we don't have to fund diarrhea treatment in the same way because the water is clean and if anyone does get sick, they can have access to rehydration salts. So yeah, I actually think your straw man is exactly right. It's Maybe this is an, a really weird analogy. It's like a champagne fountain, right? We fill up one thing. It's That's exactly how I pictured it. Literally, Jack, exactly how I pictured it. Well, this is probably why I'm described as a champagne socialist by my friend. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the examples Jack is giving, like you probably like read about it, right? You've probably seen documentaries about it. But the reality is a lot of these problems are really neglected. Like you think like, oh, running water, we will have solved for that. Vitamin A deficiencies will have solved for that. Basic categorized surgeries will solve for that. We have, we have solved for those things in the United States where I live or the UK where Jack lives, but it's not the case everywhere in the world. And so, you know, going back to that discussion around like, if I'm going to give, I want to give to something locally where I can see the impact of it and I can see those people or see those animals or see those that are suffering. And you can see that. Yes, you can see that. But measuring the effects of that far away. Like the math behind that is just so, so real for me. And so it's not that I don't want to give locally to my community here in Ogden. In fact, like I do volunteer work with my skills, time and energy here, but I can't really hop on a plane and go over to somewhere in Kenya or Nigeria or Laos. I don't really have the personal skills to help (laughs) administer immunizations. I don't understand the local culture. I won't necessarily have like a great impact in that way that I might locally hear my community with more of my time and my personal physical self there, which is why I like to spend some more of my time in that way, but then send my money elsewhere where it really can do a lot of good to causes or problem areas that are still incredibly neglected. A colleague of mine, and I'll say it's Kenan. So Kenan, if you're listening to this, I didn't steal it, had this great <laughs> phrase, which was give globally, act locally. And I really like that. Yeah, I love that. And I do want to come back because Rebecca, you mentioned a couple of times the time and skill donation. So we have two things to come back to closing the loop is the nuts and bolts 
and the time and skill donation. <laughs> But before we move on, yeah, talking about these vaccines and thinking just, again, very viscerally, because a lot of this stuff, what compels you to take action? So for instance, my uncle, my dad's brother had polio, like in his lifetime. I mean, that, that's what's so crazy. This is not that long ago. And then the remarkable nature of vaccines, which have changed the world, right? And to hear that there's a malaria vaccine coming, it's, it's incredible. And so it's so interesting to think my brain is going both ways of like, okay, obviously you've convinced me, right? Like on a, a lot of levels, the effect of altruism and like, where can you direct? But I think we also need to be honest with human nature, right? Which is why I think both of you have mentioned habits and it almost sounds crass in some sense to talk about, okay, for five or $10, you can save a life, which is remarkable and still understand the basic humanity of sometimes people need a little feedback, Right. Like I think about giving to, I think it was like donorschoose.org or something. It was something like that where I gave to a classroom and then they sent me handwritten notes from the kids. And like, frankly, that felt really good. You know, like that was pretty cool. So there's some interplay here between, I think we'd all love to live in a world where we could do this purely altruistically. But I think we also need to understand the basic nature of humanity that some feedback loop is important as well. I, I'd love to hear your just general thoughts on that. Yeah. I'd love to say this, which is if you are giving because you feel motivated to give, like it's your moral obligation to give, like J Jack, right? Like Jack said, very, very young age, I felt this moral obligation to give. That is wonderful. And there are a lot of people that that's all the information that they need to give away money. Not everyone is like that. Everyone has problems. Everyone has issues. And those problems are real. Those issues are real. I'm not taking away from that at all. But if you want to just be a good person, like if you're giving away because you're like, you know what, this makes me feel a little bit better. It makes me feel a little less guilty. That is okay too. When I pulled the early retirement trigger, it was right in the middle of COVID, right? A lot of people were struggling. They were losing their jobs. They weren't in contact with their friends. It was a really hard time. And I had got let go. I'm doing air quotations <laughs> you know, <laughs> from my job. I got four months severance package. I volunteered to be let go. And I had that like FI golden parachute. And so when I left the workforce and I hit FI, I felt incredibly guilty. Like it, it took me a while to feel comfortable with the idea of being an early retiree when not just people across the world are suffering, but like my immediate community. And I really felt that. And I actually use some of that guilt as like motivation to give back. It's a lot of it is what helped me found yield and spread and put time and energy into building that and seeing how I could help my community and my people around me during challenging COVID times, as well as create this outflow of money towards effective charities for people, you know, halfway across the world. And so what I would say is it's okay if like you feel guilty about giving. It's okay if some of it makes you uncomfortable, right? But it's all about really like thinking about what your legacy is going to be in your old age. Like once you stop working, like what do you want to be known for what makes you feel good? And I think that there's nothing wrong with that sort of level of hedonism, if you will. I also feel very strongly that giving cost effectively can be rewarding on a personal level. And if I can plug the nonprofit that I lead at the moment, One for the World, every three months, we send every donor an impact report showing exactly what they donated, which nonprofits they supported what the outputs of that were, so bed nets or vitamin A supplements or vaccines, and what the impact of that was, so how many mm -hmm. deaths they have prevented. And then we include a story from someone who has received one of these services through our amazing recommended nonprofits. And I find that intensely rewarding. But also, you are right, human nature is human nature. And if the thing that is stopping a listener from getting into this is well, I want a tighter feedback loop, do both. Give a slightly smaller amount to effective charities and give something locally. I took a pledge to give 10% of my income away. I give 10% effectively, cost effectively. 
I give about two and a half percent for a mixture of things that I think are important and really hard to measure. And then one donation that is really quite shameful that I'm not going to tell you about that is just for personal warm and fuzzies and is definitely not cost effective. And that's okay because that's part of helping me to do my philanthropy is that I want to give £30 a month to this just really, really, really non-cost effective charity that is related to rugby, which is not one of the most high priority (laughs) cause areas in the world. But that's okay. I love that too. I've I've met a lot of people within the effective altruism community that have taken a pledge like 10% and then they still keep around, you know, for lack of a better phrase, like a fun fund for giving. Because, you know, if your friend does come to you and say, hey, donate to my charity for a marathon, you don't want to go back to them and say, no way, Jose, I only donate to effective charities and your cause is ridiculous and I'm not donating to that. I don't think that's super healthy. I do think it's an opportunity to have a constructive conversation with someone about like why you choose to donate where and why, but you still can create those opportunities for yourself to donate to things that give you those warm and fuzzies. And I do the exact same as well. I do it a little more with my time. Like I said, you know, for example, I volunteer with my local adaptive ski group here in Ogden, Utah. Do I think that the money that I'm giving away is much more effective? I'm very much, it's not just think, I'm very much aware that I think it's much more effective use of my resources, but I really take in a lot of joy from the time that I spend working with people with disabilities out on the mountain. I love being outside. I love helping out. It's a great community. And so I think we can, we can do it all. We can donate to rugby causes. We can donate to our local adaptive ski clinics, and we can also give money away for fistula surgeries abroad. And it's imperative that people know that we are not on this podcast to try and shame people who do other types of philanthropy. Apart from anything else, we should be extremely cautious about saying that we know anything in this space. We think certain things are true and we are updating all the time. And then also, I think it's really wrong to suggest that people who have a personal connection to a cause or want to support a charity that they see locally are doing something that's wrong that is that is net positive that is a good thing to do mm-hmm. the only thing that i think is actually shameful is if you go through your whole life and never do any philanthropy because if you live in a high income country and you have disposable income you are in the top few percent of the whole world in terms of how privileged you are and if you literally went through your whole life and you think that every single thing that you ever get is to be spent on your own consumption, I think that is shameful. But nothing else, no other type of philanthropy, or even the patient philanthropy approach of waiting and giving later, none of these things should be shamed at all. I think it's a huge, huge error when people imply that it's morally wrong to do other types of philanthropy that aren't cost-effective giving. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. And, and I think what I'm hearing is painting the picture of a balancing act, right? And that there's no wrong answer here. But I think, Rebecca, how you were saying about, okay, maybe I think effectively globally, but then in a much more local nature, I give my time and skills and money, certainly. But it, it like that's how I'm kind of picturing a cohesive plan for myself is yeah. I can balance those two. And there's nothing wrong with that. So that, again, when my neighbor comes up to me and says, Hey, we're going to do a 5k for the local cancer foundation. Okay. Well, that's something I can still donate to obviously. And we're not saying you can't, I mean, clearly I, nobody's getting that picture, but it's important to understand there is at least how I'm seeing it. Like there can be this balancing act and that's really great. The one thing I, I did want to ask, so, okay, these effective charities, and this is more of a nuts and bolts question. So maybe we could transition into that because I think, as you know, people in the fight community, we, we have our questions, our list of, uh, am I doing this right? And, and maybe it's the old type A strivers in us, but I'm always worried about donations getting eaten up to maybe admin costs. And you hear some of the, the negative nature of that, but even just like, because I did something suboptimally, let's say. So if I were to, let's say for argument's sake, want to give thousand dollars in a year to a particular charity is it better to give it in one fell swoop or is it better to give it in eighty dollar monthly increments is that something that that i should even be thinking about or am i really just getting down into the weeds of something that's not important there is some small benefit to the charity of you doing recurring giving each month which is 
many of your listeners will have worked in businesses that focus on monthly recurring revenue. Charities are the same. That helps them to plan most effectively. If you give once a year, they have to wait 364 days to find out if you're going to re-up next year. But I wouldn't overstate this. And it is true that a lot of philanthropy happens in December, even as someone running an effective giving charity, we see 20 to 30% of our annual volume go in December at the end of the tax year. And especially at $1,000, and as long as it's happening every 12 months, I wouldn't massively beat yourself up about not doing regular giving. I would also just refer back to Rebecca's point about habit forming, though, and I have seen people who intended to donate an amount at the end of the year and then the price of the cost of living went up and then they felt a bit poorer than they did before and so they chose not to donate so much and actually probably rationally they were in the same financial position they were in before but the longer you wait the more things can distract you or undermine your resolve. So I guess on the margin I would say donate monthly. Yeah, that certainly makes sense. So, right. It doesn't sound like it's uh, a terribly massive decision either way. I'm, I'm not going to go wrong if I, I but again, I, I'm just trying to think, how can I do this optimally? If it was just something simple that would help the charity, it's good to know. So Rebecca, let's get back to some of the things you mentioned before about nuts and bolts. So you mentioned donor advised funds, donation of appreciated stock versus cash. Can you give just like a, a super quick overview of this and then maybe we can we'll reference some articles on your site in the show notes yeah sure so i created the giving guide which has all the information in there that really the everyday donor would need to know about you know how to give whether it's cash whether it's shares of a fund whether it's etfs and how to give in a tax optimized way the long skinny short of it is like obviously operationally for the donor just giving cash is really the easiest, right? Because you can just put your checking account into whatever site or you can input your credit card, right? And that money just flows to the charity right away the most easily. I think where people get tripped up is they try to give in a tax optimized way. But the reality is you have to be giving five figures away, more or less, not always. This isn't a rule of thumb, right? You have to be giving five figures away and meeting or exceeding the standard deduction to get some benefit from giving to public charities for the most part, 501c3 organizations. And so that's the skinny in terms of like how much. Now, when you give away stocks or bonds on a regular basis, if you donate those straight from your regular brokerage account, you don't get taxed on the gains from those stocks. So like the model that I use with my husband is we donate VTI to this organization called Give Directly, and we donate our shares that have appreciated the most. And so that way, when we are selling stocks to use as part of our everyday spend as part of the 4% rule, we are selling stocks that have appreciated the least so that we are taxed the least on those stocks. And then when we give away stocks to charities, since we are not taxed on those gains, that's why we choose the ones that have appreciated the most. And that is regardless of whether you've donated one share, two shares, three shares, whatever amount you're giving. However, if you are donating and you are looking to get a tax deduction, you have to meet or exceed the standard deduction here in the U.S., And so a lot of people get tripped up with that because a charity might say, make your tax deductible donation today, which is fair. It's fair that they're saying that, but it's not exactly clear. It's not exactly true. Your donation is only tax deductible if you are exceeding, you know, that 13,000 plus amount. Yeah. You also see real estate agents still talk about this with the mortgage interest deduction as well. It's uh, Oh, your mortgage interest is deductible. Well, yeah, I guess theoretically, but only if you go over the standard deduction and it's only for the portion over. So it's similar in that regard. So it's true, but not the entire picture in essence. Right. And I don't 
it's hard for a charity to come at you and say, hey, make your tax deductible donation today, but only if X, Y, Z, and A, B, C. And then you <laughs> are sitting there looking at a website and going, oh, I don't, I don't even want to donate now because this seems complicated. Right. And so it's it's actually one of the pain points within like the personal finance meets giving communities that I'm trying to tackle and trying to best understand. And please like reach out to me and have a dialogue with me about this is like, how do we give people better information around personal finances and donating without actually making it harder for them to donate because you're adding all these extra layers in our what is a very complex tax system here in the US, right? Oh, without a doubt. And so I wrote this four part blog series on donor advised funds. And if you don't know what that is, it's a tax advantaged account for giving which if you go ahead and like Google donor advised funds, like most of the results that you're going to get are ads from banks or providers about the donor advised funds. But there's a lot of things that a donor advised fund is wonderful for, but there's a lot of things that you don't really need to use it for. So I think the majority of people that I speak with about their finances, and I have a coaching program, I help people learn about their plans for giving and help them optimize with their financial plans for that. One of the things that they run into is like, oh my gosh, should I be opening all these specialized bank accounts so that I could give and then I can be the best donor that I could possibly be? But the reality is, is like, if you want to donate cash on a regular basis and you're donating, you know, four figures, go ahead, do that. Do that on a monthly basis. There's not huge ways to get more tax optimized from that. But if you are donating more meaningful sums of money, like, five figures a year, then let's talk, let's research it. Let's, you should be talking to your financial advisor. You should be talking to your tax accountant. You should be learning about the best ways to do that. Not just because it saves you money, but because it actually means more money is going to the charity itself in the end. Yeah, without a doubt. It, this is complex, but it's important. So that's why dialing in on this is so important. So we've said before in the past that if you're going to donate to a donor advised fund and there's that interplay with the standard deduction, right? So in theory, could you put multiple years of donations into your donor advised fund in one calendar year? Because then it increases the likelihood that you'll be over the standard deduction and you'll actually get a tax deduction for it. So that's one potential strategy. Yeah, that's actually some of the myths busting around DAFs that I want to do. Tell. Yeah. Which is, that's how DAFs are actually advertised to us, right? So the methodology that you just put forth is called bundling or bunching, where you take donations from multiple years into one. So let's say you could donate $5,000 each year over the next three years, or you could take all those three years of $5,000 and put it into one and donate $15,000, bring you above the standard deduction. And then you would be able to make those donations tax deductible. There's a belief that you need to put that into a donor advised fund for that result to take place. But that's not true. You can donate $15,000 in cash today and exceed the standard deduction. You could also donate $15,000 worth of appreciated stock and get that tax deduction. Or you can put it in a DAF. What is special about the DAF that the cash donation doesn't have and the stock donation doesn't have is you can put all that money into a donor advised fund today, get that deduction today, but slowly make your donations over time. Now with $15,000, this may not be as impactful. Let's say you put in $100,000 but you're not quite sure you want to donate all of your $100,000 to one specific organization, maybe there might be a different intervention you want to look at two or three years down the road. You can then say, donate $20,000 today, $20,000 tomorrow, and so on and so forth. So that is really what is special about the DAF. The second thing that's also really special about the DAF is you can automate the donation strategy. So let's say I, Rebecca, I only donate to one or two charities that I really care about, but maybe Brad, you donate to a hundred charities every month, right? That's 12,000 transactions that you'd have to do a year. You could just set that system up in a DAF 
put your $100,000 in today, and then it'll just do all those grants for you over time. So those are the two special things about a DAF that everyone should know about on this call. Yeah. And I'm glad you clarified because in my head and how we've described it previously was also how you described it with the donor advice fund. But I think the clarification that is so important, I think I took it as a given that, okay, in this hypothetical, you want to give $5,000 a year for the next three years and you put $15,000 $15,000 in donor advice fund, then you just give it out over time. But like you're saying, you could just give it all to the charity now and just essentially circumvent the donor advice fund. There's no point in the donor advice fund in that regard. So it's more, it allows you to get that tax deduction in one fell swoop in one tax year, but only if essentially you're going to give this out over time or want some optionality for potentially giving to different charities in the future. So obviously, if you made the donation all in one fell swoop, you would get the tax deduction in the current year. Right. And in the spirit of FIRE too, right? Like, let's say you have a regular brokerage account with Vanguard or Fidelity or Charles Schwab, where the fees are really low, and you're just donating to stock directly to charity. There's very few fees associated with investing. You know, in the spirit of FIRE, I'll say like, there are more fees associated with donor advised funds. And so when you invest your portfolio within that sort of account, again, you're also potentially not necessarily like this is a guarantee, but you're potentially lowering the amount that you could be donating to an organization because you put it in a DAF. So in some ways it could be a hindrance unless you're really putting in large, large sums of money that are growing over time and you can make up for those fees. But I just wanted to make that clear to listeners as well. Yeah. No, that's very important. And and just kind of going back real quick to the donating appreciated stock or funds, et cetera, because I think, I think most people just don't have a sense of just like, again, the nuts and bolts of how this works, right? So let's say hypothetically, you bought a mutual fund for $1,000 and, you know, or obviously multiple shares of that, that added to $1,000 X number of years ago, 10 years ago, and now it's worth $10,000. So if you wanted to make a $10,000 donation to a charity, I think what most people would expect is, okay, I have to sell this stock. I will get $10,000 of proceeds, but built in there was a $9,000 long-term capital gain, right? So that's going to be taxed at 15%. So come tax time, they're going to be looking at roughly what, $1,400 or 1,400 and change of tax liability that if they were actually netted out, okay, they're only left with $8,600 or some such. So do they give an $8,600 donation at that point? Do they give 10,000, but then it's really 11,400 because they had to pay this tax on it. So there's some interplay there of like, okay, what am I actually doing? As opposed to, like you're saying, you can just donate the appreciated stock. So you can donate the $10,000 of stock in that And you should, you should. You should. Like there's really no scenarios in which you should sell stock. Right. No, it's insane. Donate it, but right? nobody should, knows that. That's the thing. Right. That's the beautiful part about this. Is and like, nobody knows that because no one's advertising that to us because no one makes money off of that. Exactly. Right. Like, I mean, unfortunately I have to just be honest. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, that's it's incentives rule the world, right? So that's important. So in that case, I think most people then again, get caught up in how do I actually donate appreciated stock? Like What are the nuts and bolts of that? Like if I have a Vanguard account or Fidelity account, like just some shares sitting in my taxable brokerage account and I want to give to one of these organizations, do I initiate it? Do I call up Fidelity or Vanguard? Do I have to liaise with the, if that's even a word, with the, the charity? How the heck do I do this? So like just like with the DAF and you can do automated giving, like some banks allow for this. Most traditional banks though, what you would do is they have like a form it might call like asset gifting form, something like that. So if you just like go on your bank's website, search that term, giving, charitable giving, something like that, a form will come up and it will be, it will ask you to select the account that you want to donate from. It will ask you to select how many shares of whatever stock, bond, fund, ETF that you want. And then you will choose the tax lot that you want to give it from. So I want to give five shares from this tax lot. And so I might write one share of VTI, comma, January 1st, 2001, whenever I bought it, right? And so I'm being very clear that I'm giving that SOC. 
And then I give the charity's name and then I just sign and date. And so there are definitely ways of automating. There's third parties too. But for me, honestly, it takes two seconds to just say, here's the shares I want to give. And I like to control it a little bit because I want to look at the tax lots. Like if I bought, you know, 10 shares in January and then I bought 20 shares in March and I, once I run through my shares in January, I'm going to say, okay, I want to now go through my shares that I bought in March. And then it's just literally the click of a button. So each month when I go through my finances, I sell stock for my portfolio so I can live off of it as an early retiree. And so I go in and say, okay, I'm going to sell these shares because I'm not really earning that much income now, right? So I do go ahead and sell that. And then I, in the same vein, I just go ahead, okay, I'm donating these stocks and it takes seconds. Amazing. That's really, really helpful. Thank you for going through that. Because yeah, again, these little things, these little yeah. points of friction that hold people up, right? It's again, it's understanding human nature. We've been talking about that. That's really been a through line, a lot of, of this conversation is like, okay, the behavioral, the friction, how do I overcome it? So thank yeah. you for, for dialing in on that. And what I will say is like, if you are a person that just loves being operationally very effective and like a little fee here and there doesn't bother you, open up a donor advice fund because you can just do that once and then it's done for you for the rest of time. You don't have to choose the shares. You don't have to choose any of these things. You don't have to fill out that paperwork and sign it or not paperwork, but like e-paperwork and sign it. Right. So if you are someone who just wants to set it and forget it because you think, you know, I might not get to this or it could be hard, go ahead, open a donor advised fund. It's totally worth it then. And you can still open up a donor advised fund with our friendly for the people banks like Fidelity, Charles Schwab, so on and so forth. Nice. Yeah. We obviously don't love to give like specific financial advice here. That's always Fair dangerous enough. on a, on a podcast, <laughs> but I personally opened up a Fidelity charitable account. I think at the time I did the research, it was the lowest minimum, which again, overcoming friction. I think Vanguard had a much more significant minimum mm-hmm. contribution. I don't know if that's still the case. Are there any other that kind of rise to the top level that you would say just offhand that you've, that you've seen people talk about? I think the ones that you mentioned are great. I think Fidelity and Charles Schwab are really comparable. You're right. Vanguard has a much greater minimum. If you go to my website, yieldandspread.org and check out the four-part series DAF blog post, in the fourth post, you can go through and see a comparison of providers and who you might want to work with in opening up a DAF. Brilliant. That's absolutely perfect. And everything we've talked about in this episode, we'll have in the show notes for sure. All right. Well, I think we're kind of wrapping up here. And and this has been absolutely wonderful. So incredibly helpful. I really appreciate both of you coming on. Jack, I wanted to throw it to you for final thoughts. Is there a place that, so someone's listening to this episode, the thing that we talk about most in the Choose a Buy community is taking action. That is what separates us, I think, from any other community online or in the podcasting world. It's our people take action to make their lives better and hopefully to make their community and the world better. So where does someone go once they hit stop on this episode? I love this. And one of the things I have to do on podcasts all the time is say, if you found this convincing, don't think, well, that was interesting. And then get on (laughs) with your day, actually do something about it. So a really easy action is to go and read The Life You Can Save by Peter Singer or Doing Good Better by Will McCaskill, which are both excellent entry points to this world and were a big part of Rebecca and my journey into effective giving. I was also thinking how different types of listener might interact with this. And if you are a normal person aiming for financial independence, I would encourage you to think about giving 1% of your income effectively. It won't slow down your path to FI very much, and you will do a staggering amount of good in the meantime. But it's possible that you've already achieved FI. And in that case, I would say to you, is it possible that you have a single liquidity event coming up? That is something like you're going to receive an inheritance. Maybe you own stock in a company that's going to IPO. Maybe your wealth is growing, not shrinking because it's performing better, in which case think about making a more substantial donation. And then my final plea is, if you are in a position where you intend to give more than a million dollars, you must take advice on how to do that. Because unlike in the way that we invest in the financial independence community, 
you are basically picking winners and losers in charities because there is not a charitable ETF where you can invest equally in a large number of charities and take the average performance. You are going to put the majority of it into a small number of charities. And if you think it would be insanity to put a million dollars into one stock in the stock market or even four stocks in the stock market without doing an enormous amount of research and taking advice, it would also be insanity for you to just pick four charities and put a million dollars into it. So if you are in a position to do that, because you have achieved financial independence, or maybe you have a liquidity event coming up, then please, please get in touch. And I am one of the people who can do this for you. But there are other excellent people out there who can help you to make incredibly cost effective donations. Great advice. And that's a perfect way because I was going to ask, okay, how can people get in touch with each of you? So Jack, just uh, launch from there. So you can reach me through the website of One for the World, which is oneforTheWorld.org. That's one, the numeral, not the word. I am actually transitioning out of One for the World. I'm not entirely sure if that will have happened by the time this podcast is released. But if so, you can find me on LinkedIn. There are two Jack Lewises. If you find the guy who does a lot of production in Hollywood on films, that is the wrong guy. <laughs> That's fantastic. And Rebecca, where can people reach you? Yeah, you can reach out to me at yieldandspread.org. I would love to hear from you. There's a bunch of things that I mentioned already, the philanthropy calculator, our giving guide, and the coaching program. I'd personally love to meet you if you are on the path to FI or thinking about giving and just want a little bit of love with your financial plans to see if it's feasible or doable. I would love to chat. So just reach out to me there. Amazing. Thank you both for coming on. This is really, really a wonderful episode. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Brad. Thanks for having us, Brad. I really enjoyed it.